Good morning, everybody. Um, this is Wood Turner's Coffee Hour number 91, and it's uh, February 24th, 2022. And I'm seeing 39 logged on, and uh, 6 times 5, 34 of them with actually with video on. So there's five people who are on the call who are not showing up on the screen because they don't have their video on. Um, I would invite you to turn your video on if you like, if you can, but if you can't, then uh, for whatever reason, so it goes. <clears throat> uh, let me see. This is a show and tell day, and I'm going to uh, pull the room and see who's got stuff they want to show. But first, we have a, ver a number of announcements that we'd like to uh, make. Um, first of all, uh, for Lancaster Club, I want to remind you all that the monthly club meeting is Tuesday night next week. Um, and we'll have a demo on food safe finishing from Matt Kilareski. Um, we'll have a limited cast of characters at our new space. Uh, we'll be piloting, I think, the new arrangement of the space so that we're ready for a grand reopening with our new lathe and our space properly arranged for the April meeting. So this is kind of a dry run toward April. Um, and it'll be a good meeting. It'll also be a Zoom meeting, of course. Uh, also on March 17th, we're going to not have coffee hour in the morning. We're going to have co cocktail hour at 6 in the evening with Richard Raffin. Richard will show us a few slides and answer questions and join the discussion and, uh, and like that. And we'll have a chance to tell him how much we've all benefited from his books. Um, let me see what else I want. Oh, Ron, Ron, where's Ron? Ron Sheehan. You wanted to tell us about the Mid-Atlantic Symposium. Uh, you want to spotlight him? We have, uh, we had a board meeting 9th of February and we decided uh, we, we are going to try to schedule the, the symposium. Uh, it's set up at the Marriott Hotel in Lancaster, 23, 24, 25 of September. That's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So we're working on plans on that now. We, we're trying to line up our demonstrators that we had scheduled uh, last year when we canceled. Try to ask them to, to reserve this year for us. So we're, we're confirming all those reservations. We don't have anything confirmed yet, but we'll get that information out as soon as we can. So, Ron, at the last time, when was the last Mid Atlantic? Uh, 19. And how many people attended that? Uh, we were over 200, uh, 225, 230, somewhere in that neighborhood. And do you know how that stacks up against some of the other regionals? Uh, it's, it, it's comparable. Uh, Tennessee's been going a much longer time period. They go, they're quite a bit bigger. Uh, and I, I haven't looked at totally turning up in New York, they probably get about the same as we get, maybe a little more. They're bigger, I think. I, last time I went there, that was quite a bit bigger, but it was a long yeah. time ago. Well, that's, that in, that's combined with the furniture operation yep. as well as, yep. as turning. I think there are other woodworkers in that. But at uh, any rate, that's, that's the plan right now. Uh, we're hoping we can get uh, 150, 200 people. The problem is once we commit to the hotel, we're in for a fair amount of money, and if we don't have the reservation, reser we don't have enough funding to cover the, the minimum requirements. So we're we're in a bind on that particular case, but we're going to give it a try. Hopefully, we'll get some people to sign up. What do you think is the minimum number for the hotel? Uh, it's it's over two fifty two two fifty two eighty okay. type of number. And, and Mid-Atlantic is a consortium uh, uh, chapter of 10 clubs in our area. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we started it in, in 14 with uh, 10 clubs that had signed up and agreed to support it. Uh, we're looking at, uh, according to my notes here, the fee will be somewhere in the range of $175 to $195, we're thinking. And that, that's a four-day event or three-day event, uh, Friday evening, all day Saturday and, and Sunday. Uh, we'll have four rooms going. So some of the people on, on the site, I'm sure, are not familiar with it. But yeah, we'll have four, four rooms going uh, with demonstrations, an hour and a half demonstration. And uh, generally, we'll have four or five, maybe six different demonstrators. And we're going to try to have uh, a 
a vendor room, with, but we're thinking that may be difficult to get people in with that. But we usually try to get a, a pretty good room full of vendors. And as I recollect, the last program was demos and all that on Friday and Saturday, and then Sunday was like a, a sort of a party, a lunch party. Well, we had we had rotations in the morning and Sunday. Okay. And then we ended up with, uh, yeah, a uh, lunch with uh, a demonstration after right after lunch in the lunchroom in the in the big banquet hall. Yeah, that was fun. And end about mid afternoon on Sunday. Yeah. And uh, and of course we need we'll need some volunteers to help with the thing. I generally handle moving the equipment in. We have all the equipment in Lancaster now, so that should be a little bit. Easy. Although we have to go to New Holland for a lathe, but uh, yeah, getting that lathe out of New Holland isn't going to be easy, but it can be done. Yeah, yeah. So uh, hopefully the Lancaster Club will step up, and anybody else that's interested, we'll be looking for volunteers on that later on. Okay. Any so, what? Anyway, just a, a few words on that to give everybody a heads up on it. Look for the information to come out. Any questions or comments about that or other regional symposia? Okay. Thank you, Ron. Um, I also, before we go to uh, shows and tells and things, I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to talk about our videos. I'm curious, uh, give me back to a gallery view, Jim, if you can. I don't want to be spotlighted. I want to see the gallery. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know if I can, uh, first of all, how many of you guys watch any of our videos? Okay. So do you like the, uh, since the beginning of the year, we've been breaking short videos. We've been posting the full hour. And then if there's a coherent 10 or five or 15 minute chunk, uh, we've been breaking that out as a separate video. Do you watch those? It's even yes. Better. Do, do you like those? Yeah. 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 Yes. Great idea. Okay. Um, let me see. How did you like the Steve Lore show last week? Excellent. Any, any was great. Great. Any, great. Any, any critique or comments I should pass back to Steve? Uh, we didn't have enough time for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he he shortened his slideshow for our hour. He could have gone on for the whole day, I think, without any trouble. <laughs> that would have been all I right. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so that's the, maybe that's the question. When we have a special event like that, would you guys be up for a longer program for like an hour and a half or a two hour show sometime? Was that, is that what you'd prefer? Definitely. Sure. Definitely. Yeah, we could do that. Uh -huh. I think we would need, I think we need that for Richard Raffin. Well, he's agreed to an hour, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, we, right. Also, I got out of yes, last week's, uh, you know, our design of firewood, he, he gets, it seems like, I don't want to call it rejects, but design of firewood, and he's collaborating with a lot of people with their mistakes and failures, and he's putting it all together. And I think we need to collaborate a little bit more between us. You know, we could send a piece that's not working for us to somebody else and see what they can do with it. Well, do you think we ought to do that in an organized way, or should we just leave you to make friends with each other? That's up to everybody. That's not my decision. Yeah. You know, it's just a thought, you know, and stuff. But uh, you well, know, one if somebody of the, sent me a piece, I would try to work on it a little bit further, you know. Well, one of the thoughts, one of the things that I sort of hope is going on in the background is this, is people encounter one another here at Coffee Hour and get in touch afterwards and uh, become friends. I know that I've got a number of guys here in this call who I talk to on the phone from time to time because of, as a result of Coffee Hour. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm the thing I best I can say about that, Charlie, is to invite, invite everybody to do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you encounter right. somebody on here and you want to get in touch with them uh, and you don't have their email, get in touch with me and I'll send you both the same email introducing each other and you can carry on together or not. What do people feel about that idea right now? Charlie, Are they for it or against it? Charlie, why don't you start a, a Tuesday morning funnel club uh wood for wood turners <laughs> <laughs> yeah right okay so you send, out, you send out the entire list club list every month don't you we send the club list but we don't send the list there's a lot of guys on this call who are not club members oh i see okay yeah. uh, i guess i wouldn't mind a little poll of that too while we're at it how many are not lancaster club members it's okay if you're not you're still welcome here 
Okay, so we're still running a majority of Lancaster Club members on this call. Yeah, and of course anybody who isn't a Lancaster Club member is welcome to join, but you're not required to. Um, but quite a few people on here have as a result of Coffee Hour, which the club has enjoyed a lot. Um, and in fact, as a result, the club has grown from 40 members to 75, I think now, maybe 76. So, um, well, we're talking about that then. Well, let's, let me go back if there's anybody else with any comment for Steve Lore, because Steve was interested to know if we had any feedback that would help him next time he does it. I thought it was a great show. Yeah. Um, and finally, and while we're talking about that, before we go on, I wonder if there's anybody out here who would like to get involved in editing the Coffee Hour videos. It's a, it's become a bigger chore than it used to be. It takes me a bunch of time, and I wouldn't mind having an, either a colleague who already knew how to edit or an apprentice I could work with, um, and we could you know sort of share the workload a little bit. It takes it it takes about three hours to process an hour of video, and sometimes it takes six hours when you start to break them out. Um, and that's because I've got quite a bit of skill at it now. I've been doing it for a couple of years. Um, there's a learning curve, that's for sure. Um, I guess I don't want to go for a show of hands right now. I'd rather have, if anybody would like to get involved in that, get in touch with me and we'll have a, we'll have a phone call. Um, okay, back to our regular programming here this week, I think. Um, I think this is a show and tell. I see three hands up, and I know Kai has some stuff he could show. I'm also interested in new guys. Um, there's new people out here who we've, um, who've just shown up here from wherever. Um, would any of you like to introduce yourselves today? Show us a bit of work and tell, you what you're, tell us what you're doing here. If you would, use Ray's hand. We, we use Ray's hand here a lot. It helps a lot to keep the, to, for us to keep track and keep the meeting flowing along. So if you'd like a piece of the floor, today, or if you'd like to introduce yourself, raise your hand and you'll join the queue. I see uh, seven, eight, nine up there with raised hands now, which is pretty much going to fill our hour. Brewbaker's down there too. I know that Brewbaker, you wanted to talk about would you have. Do you want to talk about that right now? Oh, I could. Do it, please. Uh, I've got a garden shed with stacks of wood in it that I was going to get to sometime, but it's obvious uh, I've got more out there than I'm ever going to use. And uh, so I'm feeling generous right now. In addition to ash and uh, walnut, and uh, one of my favorites is uh, yew um, and a bunch of other things. But I also have some planks. The whole back wall of my garden shed is stacks of planks, of walnut. It's not all the dark black walnut. It's the uh, uh, the browns and uh, blues and the grays in there as well. Um, so if uh, you're interested in having some of it, uh, get a hold of me and we'll arrange a time to check it out and see what I've got. What town are you in? Ephrata. Ephrata. Okay, that's north of Lancaster here. Yep. Just hey, in the south. Hey, Dart. South Asia. This is, yeah. This is Barry Price. We're looking at uh, we gotta, we're looking at uh, as a fundraiser uh, for the club. Uh, Don's offer of wood. Uh, I think the club is still moving toward having a wood sale uh, as fundraiser. And uh, if we are going to do that, we would appreciate. Uh, maybe some of Don's wood being donated to the, the fundraiser uh, for sale by the club. Okay, I want to say something about that too. Um, the club fundraiser, when we last talked about it, we were pretty clear, I think, that we don't want your bad wood, we want your good wood. Um, in other words, don't, we don't want, do not want to use the club fundraiser as a place to dump wood that you're not going to do anything with because it's crappy wood. Uh, we would much rather you donate some wood that you'd like to turn someday if you ever get around to it because it's good wood and we'll have a fundraiser with that rather than with bad wood, um, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm going to go to the rotation here, I think, and I think I'm going to start, I'm going to, I'm going to look for people I haven't heard from in a while. Um, when I see, uh, I see Ted Latrell we haven't heard from in a while. What do you have, Ted? 
Okay, I'll let me do a screen share here. Okay, should be able to see that. We got it. All right. So uh, just some recent turnings. I uh, I decided to make myself a um, a maple martini, but instead of using you know maple syrup in the mix, I just turned a maple martini glass. <laughs> <laughs> You know, add, add, add the spirits to your taste. <laughs> um, What's the noted. finish? What's the finish on that? That is not finished. Okay. That's the that's right off the lathe, uh, and I sand down to about twelve hundred. What are you going to finish it with? Um, I don't know if I have the pit. I put. Uh, I've already put three coats of hand rub polyurethane on it. Okay, that'll work against your alcohol. You can hold gin, and that'll hold gin. Yeah, that was the idea. <laughs> okay, uh, let me get rid of that. Um, I wanted to talk about piercing a little bit. I may have showed this last year. I don't know. Uh, a year ago, Christmas, I tried my first piercing. This is a earring tree for my daughter. And I had a hell of a time piercing that wood. I had to drill holes and then I used a bit to try to, you know, make them in odd shapes. But uh, since our... Um, since our uh, presentations on piercing and so forth, um, I've discovered a new, uh, a new tool, which I wanted to talk about. The bit you see on the bottom is what I used last year, and it's horrible. Uh, and I was using this in a Dremel tool, by the way, that turns about 35,000. It's not a Dremel, but a Dremel-like tool. Uh, and that bit wanders all over the place, very hard to control, and it burns. So after the demos we've had on piercing, I started looking for other tools. Anyhow, I found the bit above. These are wonderful. These bits are um, for milling, CNC milling machines, um, and they're wonderful. Uh, if you look at the, it doesn't, it doesn't wander all over the place. You can drill a hole straight through. So um, you can see it in the uh, in my uh, pencil holder there and the ones on the right like I said I bought last year they're horrible they might be okay for um, you know doing some carving and stuff I mean these the ones on the left are horrible the ones on the right are what I bought and the interesting thing about these is they go from uh, three millimeters down to 0.3 millimeters and I, I found them very effective um, so that was uh, the, the the first one I showed the tree I did last year it took me hours this bowl took me about an hour, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good. Does that have something to do with how thick the wood is? No, um, not really. The, um, that wood is an eighth of an inch and, and it should be thinner. But the other bowl, the other piece was a little bit thicker, but these bits, again, are, are made for milling. You can push them down into a wood and uh, if it's thicker, it takes a little bit longer, but not much. I found Are they upcut spiral bits? Say again. Are they upcut spiral bits? They are. What are they? Like? Yeah. What are they? Router uh, bits. They're, they're C and C bits. So Where do you purchase them? Amazon. Okay. I'll send the link to John. He can put it out there. Yeah, dude. Okay. There's several of them. They're very good, um, and that's the that particular piece finished. I, I, these were these were just little bowls I had done, you know, candy dishes, and they were thin enough. I said, "Well, I'm going to try it and play with it." But I was so impressed with how quickly it went. Here's another piece, which was just a pencil holder in my shop, and I said, "Well, I'll do the top." You know, <laughs> and, uh, it came out pretty good. I, I really like it. So, what are you trying to represent with that pattern of holes? What's that mean to you? That means nothing. It was a random pattern. Okay. <laughs> So uh, I just wanted to mention that and the tool. Uh, it, it's not so much the tool. Oh, by the way, I should comment on that. I did buy an air tool that turns at 65,000 RPM, which is even, you know, you would think would be even better. But I discovered that with, uh, with these bits, they're designed for, you know, milling speeds of, you know, 25, 30,000 RPM. They're designed for routers. So um, I didn't think the extra speed made all that much difference. Um, there are tools, I don't have a picture of it here, but I bought another air tool 
that it runs about two cubic feet of air per minute. And I, I liked it, except I discovered I didn't need it. And, um, and I didn't like that my, my compressor didn't really support the two cubic feet per minute for that kind of application. So, uh, so I went back to the Dremel tool, uh, which I really like. Well, you mentioned uh, the thing wandering or wobbling around in the high speed. That what I heard, I don't do the piercing, but what I heard was that the higher speed will eliminate the wandering on the tool. If you do a 50,000, they might wander. If you get up to the 100,000s, then they don't wander as much. But that, that router bit looks like a, a better solution to it for me. Well, you're absolutely correct. With the lower bit that I'm showing now, it, it wanders all over hell, and a high speed would make a huge difference. Yeah. The upper bit, if you look at the pattern in there, um, the way it's designed, it just it doesn't seem to do that. Looks it's like been, it's got multiple flutes. Yeah. It's it's just one. It looks like it has uh, flutes going both directions. It does, and I think that's why it doesn't wander compared to the one below. Yeah. And, and if you look at the end of it, it's very easy to drill. <laughs> the bottom bit, if you try to drill a hole with that, you end up all over the place. You can't yeah. do it. Yeah. The top bit just drills like a regular drill. You can touch it lightly and go right through without, without getting shoved off the area where you want to work and, you know, making, uh, marring the piece. So um, I'll, I'll take a... Uh, I'll, I'll send some, I don't remember the exact brand name. I'll send some photos uh, and some links to John so you guys can, can yeah. land there. All, by the way, that sets about 15 bucks and it's fine grain um, uh, carbide material. I've been using some down cut spiral bits and, and I don't like them. I'd rather have an up cut. And uh, so that might be a, a solution. Uh, these, these are up cuts. You can see it from the. Yeah. Right. So uh, that, that's all I, I had, unless somebody has more questions. No, I'm going to stop your share. Yeah, good. Any other questions for Ted? Or other experiences with those kinds of bits you'd like to add in? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I'm being slow and holding here looking for questions is uh, we're all on one screen here, but just barely on my computer. I can see up to 49 and we got 43 on. Uh, when there's more than that, I need to go look at a, a second screen to see hands. And I realize in recent me weeks, I've been leaving hands un unattended to on the second screen because I haven't been taking the time to look there. So, so I'm trying to change my habits to look a, look a little more deep in, in here. John, that's a good reason they should use reaction mode. Yeah. Because then it moves it to the top and you don't have to look around all the screens. I'm I'm running 25 uh, and uh, and I have to look at two screens. But if you raise your hand, you're in my top two rows. Yeah, that's what we want. Yep. So if there's somebody who wants to jump in the conversation and use raise hand, you'll go to the head of the queue and we'll spot you pop up there. So, OK, I'm going to move on from Ted. Uh, uh, remind let's, let's remind move me to again, how, 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 where do I find the raise hand? Oh, yeah. Raise hand is down on the bottom of your screen. You see the reactions tab, little button that says reactions third from the right on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, there it is. Okay. Click reactions. And got it. You got it. Okay. Anybody else need help finding raise hand? Everybody needs to know about raise hand in this environment. Okay. Ken Vasco, what would you like to do? Uh, I was, uh, I did a demonstration for the Nittany Valley wood turners, uh, in January. And when you do demonstrations, you always have extra pieces of wood and things like that around. So uh, I had some sumac, uh, in the shop and I didn't really know what to do with it. Wasn't really sure. I used that as the demonstration piece. And what I came up with was, uh, two little bowls. That's uh, sumac? That's sumac. How'd you get a piece of sumac even that big? Well, it was on the edge of my property and it was in with a maple tree. And they're, they're about four and a, this one's four and a half inches, four and a half inches, but you can see the grain is just incredible. There's orange and reds and things that I'm not sure the camera's picking up. Yeah, we're getting it. But it came out real nice. And this, this shape, 
Uh, I've been reading a little bit about Ir the Irish Viking Bowl. I don't know if anybody's read about that yet, but uh, this is sort of the shape of the Irish Viking Bowl. You can see it comes up and has a little lip. I think it's a uh, thousand years old and it was found in Dublin. Uh, there's more to that story, but I'm not sure about it at all. But uh, I, try, I tried to really make sure that the grains were matched on the inside. The first piece I did wasn't as good, done as well. Sure. This one came out real nice. Did you have any reaction from the wood chips? I thought sumac's kind of poisonous. No, there's all sorts of sumacs, and there is poison sumac, but this is not. I looked it up before I started turning it, <laughs> just to be sure, because I wasn't sure either. And I think when we were a kid, we used to call it shumac. I don't know why, but now we call it sumac. So, but yeah, I looked it up in, uh, on the wood database, and there's actually it's it's used by wood turners supposedly. Okay. Ken, Ken, is that uh, dramatic grain apparent when you cut the tree down, or does that like turn those contrasting shades only after it's been dried? No, it, when you when you cut the end grain, you can't really see much. It's it's uh, hard, soft, hard, soft grain. But then, as soon as you open it up, you cut it in half. Then you start to see the grain, the color in it. So you're right, though. It is it's hard to find another piece that big, but I have another one that's about almost that big, so I'll probably cut it down and dry it too. All right. Any questions for Ken? Okay. Duxbury, would you like a minute here? What do you got? Oh, I could do that. I, bet I you think could. the theme to the theme for today was tool storage. Yeah. I rotate between at least three layers, usually four or sometimes. But uh, moving your tools back and forth is a real pain in the neck. So like yours, John, I got a, I got a tool cart on the top is all my tools are all in a row. Um, I got dividers on one side, calipers on the other side, my face shield. In this drawer is sandpaper. This drawer is all my jigs and or adapters and things. I think I can show this side of it. Uh, this is the side of it. I have uh, my big calipers, big uh, dividers, and that sort of thing around the side. Do you have more tools than that stash somewhere, or is that your whole kit? Oh, you got to be kidding. <laughs> yes, there's a whole pile of them. This is the ones I use actively from lathe to lathe. Uh, how, many, how many lathes do you have and why? Five, but uh, two are my wife's and uh, three are mine. And they're different sizes. Um, I don't know. They just they all have different purposes. And uh, I like using the little ones. I use a 10 inch lathe most of the time because everything weighs about a tenth of what it does on the big power Matic. But uh, uh, it's easy to just roll from one to another. I do 80% of my work on a 10 inch lathe, I think. Uh, Anyway, this is the other side. These are more calipers and things. On the bottom are tool rests and adapters in here. Uh, this is the drawer. This is sandpaper. You can tell I cleaned for this shot. So these are all adapters <laughs> and different whatever. And uh, underneath is the uh, underneath is vacuum chucks, holders, and threaders, and more chucks and all sorts of things. I'm back to a side-by-side -side gallery looking for questions for Jim. Any questions for Jim? I have a portable one too, if you want to. Go ahead. Looking for questions or comments. I like that stand. I'm very much in favor of rolling tool stands and vertical storage of tools. I have one for my, uh, maybe I could show this part too. This should work. Right, Jim, I was impressed that you used that. Uh, like furniture grade uh, finishing on your, on a shop cabinet. I saw the square button heads on the, uh, I guess, screw head covers. Yeah, they're, they're square dowels, they're square heads on it. Uh, yeah, it's made, uh, it's made right. Yeah, I don't know, can you see that's coming up on a different- Yeah, screen. yeah, we see your tool tote. Does that full, I, I, I've been looking for a drawing of one of those and I've been drawing my own to try and, figure that out. 
Now, wait a minute. I spent half a day doing this. It'll show you the whole thing if it works. Here we go. I even had to dress for this. My wife made me change clothes. There we go. Today, I'd like to show my tool tone. Reed and I demonstrate all over the country. And to have your tools carried around in a five gallon bucket or one of those canvas sleeves with 287 little pockets just doesn't work. I developed this. Can unlock it here. The handle swings down, it becomes an easel. When you open it up, all my tools are in order. This first tool is a parting tool, the next one's a point scraper, the next one's a round nose scraper. I know exactly where those are. I change tools often, so I know exactly where these things are. This is a spacer with magnets on it, just to hold things in place while, while they're in the case. This is a uh, set of miniature tools. My chuck key, the pin for the tailstock. These are all specialized tools. This is a ring cutter, um, a little slot cutter for maybe kaleidoscopes and that sort of thing. When I do a workshop or a symposium or a demo, when I leave, if I see a slot in here, I know I'm missing a tool. You have no idea if you have all your tools in a five gallon bucket. These things are expensive. And not only that, they're exactly the way I want them. I can pick them up. They're all contained in here. Nobody's going to get cut on them. There's no point sticking out of something. I travel. They lock up this way. It slips up. Turn this little button. Pick it up. You're ready to go. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Just no end to the fun. I like that. Hey, does that, clear, does that clear airline overhead baggage compartment? <laughs> yeah. it, it went to Hawaii and the airline stuck something right through the front of it. I, I have no idea, but that that brown patch on the front of it, I have no idea what they stuck through that, but I took the handle off it and uh, put a screw right through the front so they couldn't open it <clears throat> and shipped it to Hawaii and it, it, it went, it went and back and forth, but I, I have no idea what, they can mess up anything. But anyway, uh, my tool storage saves me a lot of time. And with both of them, when I turn around, I know exactly where the tool is. You don't have to fuss around sorting through all the different handles and whatever. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Jim. You got it. Questions for Jim? Okay. How about you, Ron? What do you have today? Uh, I have a, a little show and tell I've been working on. Oh, you've Maybe been making those little day. people. Yeah. Uh, I was on the back of the uh, AAW Journal a couple of months back. And I thought, I, I've been wanting to try some. I've been making a bunch of bowls and so forth. So anyway, uh, I just picked up a, a piece of scrap. It's not a very good piece of wood. I got to tear out in the bottom and chunk. But I thought, I'll try one. I want to make more of them. But from what I saw on the, on the journal, it looks like the hat's what makes the thing. And, and I'm going to do some decorating and so forth. on. I just did some, some pen lines on here with a pen. But... Uh, and I'll probably glue the hat on it. Right now, what I did, I, I have a piece of double-sided tape inside there to, to tie it for temporary for different different lay of setups and so forth. But anyway, I'm getting into making dolls. That's very good. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Jeff Carroll. Good morning. Good morning. I've been working on some... Um, bread plates, ambrosia maple, before I've still got finished drying on one of them, but 
they were a lot of fun to turn. That's just a piece of ambrosia I had and I uh, split it in two and made a couple out of them. And then I cut another piece and cut it in two and made two more. So. Now, how'd you hold those on the lathe? The, um, I had a tenon on the back. And then when I finished the back, I just used cold jaws. Okay, questions for Jeff? Questions, comments? How thick are those plates, Jeff? I didn't get a sense of that. Um, three quarters of an inch, maybe. But the, the wood itself isn't that thick. I mean, that's, that's the whole total height, right? Right, right. The wood itself looks like maybe quarter inch, three eighths. Spotlight me again and I'll hold it up sideways. My, my um, ruler eyeball says five sixteenths. <laughs> Any other questions or comments for Jeff? Uh, Michael Brazo. Okay, I'll do a share screen here, guys. Go for it. And uh, this is something I put together, I don't know, almost 20 years ago. A little cabinet for all the odds and ends. It's got wood dust, um, you know, fillers hey, for epoxy, you know, bits for hollowing, um, whatever. It, 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 it's a mess, or I'd take a picture of the interior. The carousel on the top, <clears throat> I've added a lot more holes to it, and I've really got probably another dozen tools that, it, in addition to that. But uh, I know a lot of people don't like carousels with uh, tools pointing upwards, but I've only stabbed myself a couple of times in 20 years and, and nothing dramatic. So it's worked really well, really, really well for me. Um, Looks a little dangerous. I also want to metal for those quick... tools. Yeah, well, if you go in, arc, arc in from the top, you know, it, you learn your lessons pretty quick. <laughs> this yeah. is something. Why, yeah. why wouldn't you store them the other way up with the cut edge down? I, I have actually some in the inner area that my old, some old Delta tools that I do. I just, I just prefer to be able to see them. I. Oh. Because I can usually tell them from the handles, you know, and from the yeah, blade, I know what it is anyhow. Yeah, I make all my own handles too. So uh, I have a lot, through, I have a lot of tools that I've added. This picture is, is 15 years old. Okay. But um, I have one rack just for bowl gouges now. This is something I added on the back of my 2436. It's just a piece of two by eight. Uh, drill holes as needed. And as you can see, I've added some things in the back here for centers. It gets a little messy when you're turning, but it really isn't that big a deal to clean up. Um, particularly if you're doing spindle turning and it's dry wood, it's just chips. If you're, you're turning green wood, of course, you get some shavings and piles on, but uh, between an air hose and plucking it off and the vacuum uh, cleans up. I just find it really, really handy um, to be able to grab stuff without having to even turn around, just reach over and there it is. So I have some other stuff, but um, how do I get out of this now? If I hit escape, I guess, but um, I'll stop by sharing. <clears throat> I have a write up that if you Google Mike Brazo storage, there's a number of clubs that have got it posted on there uh, that I did years ago. I have one other stand uh, that I made now just as bull gouges, which I made, like Jim said, moving from lathe to lathe. And um, it's really become my bull gouge stand and some other odds and ends in it, but just handy. So wait a minute, are you saying you got some plans out there for a tool cabinet or something? Yeah, let me let me see if I can show you the share screen again and I'll go to the Adobe. This is how I started with this thing. So that um, it tells the story and gives you a brief description of um, of how I made it. This is how one started out. Truck knocked over my mailbox. I had a piece of four by four. I originally had that attached to my old Delta Homecraft and I found it got in the way. So I put it on a separate stand. Now I've had quite a few things on separate stands in my shop and I find that it's a real bear to sweep up around them. I don't like them anymore. I like to have it mounted so it doesn't have any footprint. Yeah, it's... Um... My, my shop, my garage is a real mess right now. So 
I need to I need to host the hands on. I, I hosted several hands on. Cindy Drazda, Bonnie Klein, uh, Doug Fisher, a few years back, and the place was all spick and span, you know, and all set up a half dozen lathes, and now it's a total disaster. <laughs> so you you got to stop what you're doing for a month and clean it up. <laughs> anyway. Okay, is that it from you? Yeah. Okay. Who else we got next here? Um, just uh, Mark Skinner. What do you have today? So I have a couple of uh, small cherry bowls. Uh, basically, uh, I, we burn a lot of firewood. Bring it closer to your face, we can so we can see the whole bowl. There you go. Yep. And then uh, okay. let's see inside and underneath. Good. Okay. Now why are you making it thick and heavy like that? Well, if, if you notice, the uh, uh, piece had a number of cracks in it, so I left it heavy. Also, I like heavy bowls. Are you going to fill those cracks in with anything? They are filled with, uh, with uh, CA. Once you fill them with CA, do you then have to return it to get back to the surface? Yeah, well, I, I fill them uh, early on, so they just get turned. Okay. But uh, I, I really like the color in this cherry. It's a nice shape too. Thank you. So again, it just, you know, it was a piece of firewood and I said, huh, nice color. Maybe it's, I won't burn it after all. So, <laughs> so just simple stuff. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Don Brubaker. Yes. Um, my brother has been a woodworker and carpenter all of his career. And uh, I was driving past uh, his workshop uh, some recently and uh, noticed his van parked there. So I went in, had a chat with him. As I looked around his workshop, I saw a block, uh, a block of wood and uh, was intrigued by the bold uh, lines on, on the block and uh, said you want it sure and uh, thought i would make a, a, a ball out of it and uh, like an oversized croquet ball or something and is that attached uh, to the base it, it is attached yes um, is it solid it's solid yeah um, and I tried to make a ball, but it came out more like an egg or an oval. <laughs> um, it, uh, sort of feels like a little boy's head and, uh, sort of feels good. So I gave him a name. This is Dougie. <laughs> but he matches your own haircut. You got the well, same haircut. He's got the same haircut as you. There must be some Brubaker jeans in here too, somewhere. <laughs> but uh, Dougie's last name is Fur. <laughs> he must it. have got hit on the head, though. He has a bump on the top of his head. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Okay, so while we're looking at you, what's all that stuff over behind you, over your shoulder? Oh, um, yes. On the yeah, that's a photo. Uh, area to take pictures of the various pieces and uh, included in there is um, I think it's a maple burl that uh, a friend gave me he is a wood uh, a cutter uh, works with trees uh, arborist I guess would be the term I came, I was gone most of the day and I came home and here in the middle of my driveway was a huge burl, maybe two feet in diameter. Um, I almost had difficulty carrying it down to my workshop. And uh, so several of the pieces there are uh, various items I made from that burl. Well, maybe you could show us those one day. Um, all right, I'll, I'll plan on that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'd like to see those. But I'm going to move on now, unless you want to go on. on the, okay. Okay. Bert, what do you have? I'm muting myself here. Okay, I'm unmuted. I was just going to share a screen. 
And can you see my uh, my what? Can you see my um, yeah. air cleaner? Okay, that's my shop, and that's uh, the most recent addition to my shop is a two horsepower air cleaner. It completely changes all the air in my shop every three minutes. I've got a twenty-four by twenty-four shop, and it's only two horsepower. And I was on a Zoom call with that thing running, and nobody could hear it. It's that, an amazing piece of equipment. Is that one of those Oneida things? Uh, well, it's uh, it, it's got a, a cyclone. It's not Oneida. It's I uh, bought it from Canadian Woodworker. I forget um, the exact name on it, but uh, it's uh, definitely uh, the cyclones are definitely worth uh, the effort. And I hard plumbed it into the shop, so it's hanging from the ceiling, six inch at the lathe, four inch for everything else. And I leave a six inch and a four inch open all the time. Uh, there's a six inch on the lathe is always open and one of the other four inches. And I found that that is uh, uh, making the filter do what it's supposed to do. The filter sees 1500 cubic feet a minute all the time. And it works like a charm. And we were talking about tools. Well, there's my uh, latest tool rack. Uh, I've got uh, um, beside my lathe, it's on wheels so I can wheel it around and all my uh, calipers and stuff are hanging below and my Allen wrenches are in drilled holes. Uh, I have so many tools that I ended up putting a, an extra bench in there with a hinge on it so I can just open it up and there's a second rack of tools. And That's if I clever. Go on, the other, on the other side of the same rack, I uh, wanted to put more tools, so I put a, a third rack on and I found an extra pair of hinges, so I ended up putting a fourth rack on. So I, uh, there's 40 <laughs> tools standing there. I don't use them all the time. But what I really found is that now that they're not in a drawer and they're right there available, I can see them. I'm starting to use some of the tools that I would never, never have taken the time to go look for. And um, it's just a convenience thing. And I mean, that's the result of me spending that time in Sheffield. Every time I came home from Sheffield, I had another handful of Henry Taylor tools in my suitcase. So I, I ended up buying all my tools before I retired. So I, I've got just about every piece of steel I think I'll ever need. And, uh, and it works great. And uh, all the all the points are pointing up, so I don't have to worry about anybody walking through the shop and getting stabbed. And if I need an inside one, I just open the door and it's there. That's all I got. All right. Any questions for Bert? It looked like yeah. in your first slide you have the cyclone hooked up to your grinder. Is that right? Uh, I have a. a let's see. That was the first one here, or the second picture. Uh, I've got a four inch drop down uh, that goes uh, directly to my bandsaw. And then the one that's hanging right beside it, it's, it's just kind of a loop. I use that for my uh, thickness sander. And uh, I thought about the uh, grinder, uh, but the grinder doesn't have anything connected to it. So um, yeah, it doesn't pull any sparks. Well, they're CBN, so there's very few sparks anyhow, but no, I don't have a, a hose connected to the grinder. No, I think that's it's good that you don't. It's uh, scary to hook one up to a grinder, even with the yeah. CBN wheels. It only takes a spark to. Uh, that's correct. But, yeah. but, but but what about all that metal dust in the air? Oh, uh, there's very little metal dust off of CBN because you only spend like ten seconds. Uh, it's amazing how little time I spend at the grinder now that I've got CBNs. Well, I have magnets on my CBN, and it's amazing how much metal filings collects on the magnets, and it makes me wonder how much more is getting into the air that's not on the magnets. Ah, good point. I always thought metal was heavier than wood, so it wouldn't float. It would uh, go down. Mm. Would help you. That dust is awfully fine. I, I, I've been worrying about that. Oh, okay. I, I wonder point. if anybody has any information. No, I don't know the answer to that too, but it does seem to settle very quickly. I think it is heavy. No dust collector is a respirator. You've got to wear a respirator if you want to protect your lungs. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. I like the magnet idea. That's yeah, magnets help. They get a lot of they collect a lot of it. They really do. I have a bowl about this big full of uh magnet dust, the magnet powder on the, yeah. If you look at that magnet, size magnet? Couple of months, it looks like a soft it looks like a tennis ball. What size what magnet, put, John? Uh, whatever I can find to fit down in there, I buy those rare earth magnets. I get little rectangular ones that are about the size of a, a little square of chocolate with a screw hole in them and screw them on wherever I think there's dust coming off. I have a shroud around the grinder as well, so I'm really trying to catch that metal dust before it gets into my air. Mm. 
But I also like Duxbury's idea of running uh, the, the grinder backwards with CBN and just kind of stroking the tool. I think that don't make much dust. I so. love that. I, I never, once I've shaped my tool, I never turn the grinder around. I always hone it. I'm going to look into that. I'm going to play with that some more. Um, okay, I've got a couple more hands here, and I know Don Smith has been jonesing to share for a while, So Don, and I know that we got it worked out this morning. So, Donald, would you like to go for it? Well, try it. See how it goes. <clears throat> he got it to work an hour ago. Are we there? Not yet. There we are. You're there. Yep. Talk to us. Right. This is my lathe, my workshop. As you can see, my tool rack is on the corner of the wall and a magnet with very small parting tools. I have an air filter and a security light over the top of the lathe. You can't see it, but on the right hand side at the bottom here, I have other magnets which contain all my calipers. Behind what? me, is the covers with all my chucks and what have you. What kind of lathe is that? That's a Poolwood 2814. I bought it in 1984. <laughs> okay. And it's still going. And the reason I wanted to show you that, there's my bandsaw, my pillar drill. I have a sander and a router and a chop saw and my wood store is on the left here. This is my grinder with a homemade grinding jig, which again I made back in 1984. The piece here is movable and takes the bowl gouges and what you have and you set them up with a two inch gap and then you've got a ball here, there's a ball on the end, or there's another one of these I made that you can use with a point in this V shape. You've got two handles. This one here lets this piece come in and out. And then there's this one here, which allows this piece to come in and out. So because I'm against the wall, I can extend this to the full length of a roughing gouge. Nice. So, and those are uh, stone wheels, not CBN, I'm seeing. That's right. I've never gone that line. Um, getting towards the end of my running career, so I've stayed with what I've got. Now, this is a burr I got. It was about 30 inches long and 12 inches wide. I had no idea what to do with it back in 2013. So I came up with an idea. There's some idea of the shape. My uh, internet's unstable, but I'm hoping that within the next two weeks, I will have a much powerful piece. This is my first part of turning this bowl. I cut them into three pieces. And that was my chucking point, which went onto my chuck. There she is on the chuck. As you can see, it is a wedge-shaped piece of burr. And there I am starting to turn it. It's only held with that chucking point. There's the back of it. I've made a new chucking point in the base for compression, uh, for expansion rather, sorry. And that's the beginning of this bowl. I've turned around and I've started to turn the inside of the bowl. There we are, from side view. And that's the finished burr bowl. And there's the three finished bowls I took from that one burr. But the point I wanted to make was a few weeks ago, people were talking about holding it with the chucking point. And that is all I held that with on my big mark chuck. Any questions? 
What what wood is that, Burl? It was a elm burl. Very pretty burl. It was, as I say, not knowing what to do with that when I got it. And it made the three holes. Hello? Yep. This is Alan Miller. I really appreciate what you did with that. Uh, I recently picked up a fairly large cherry crotch, which I've been looking at and wondering, you know, now I got it, what do I do with it? And uh, looking at what you've done here, I, I appreciate, uh, yeah, you've given me some ideas. Thank you. Great. I'm, I'm too pleased to help in some way. All right. Any other questions for Don? Comments for Don? I want to congratulate you, Don, for mastering screen sharing and uh, for sticking with it. It was very, very brave of you. Thank you. I'll uh, come up in a couple of weeks' time and show you a couple more things I've made, which are more sellable for me. One of them I've made over a hundred of them. When you see it, you'll appreciate when I say I've made a hundred. We all like to see that and win whenever you're ready. Um, yeah. We're on the hour and I'm leaving Mike Peace and Harvey Porter on the table. I'm hoping you guys will be back next week and we'll do it again. You go to the head of the queue next week if you get bumped off this week. And if you, Mike, if you talk to our friend Michael Gibson, he got knocked off of here several times and I hope he didn't go away mad because we'll have him at the head of the queue next week as well. No, he probably had a conflict. Okay, good, because I know that he was left behind uh, several weeks running. Uh, we're going to wrap this up unless anybody's got any uh, last remarks that they're dying to say. Now's your chance. Alan, I want to know what you do with that big cherry crotch. I have one sitting in my driveway and I'm doing the same thing. It's way too big for my lathe, but I want to use it. If you come up with a brilliant idea and mind sharing it, I'd be welcome of your input. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, and I would like to know all that too. And on that note, everybody, this is the end of Lancaster Woodturner's Coffee Hour number 91. Thank you for your participation. It's been a very fun hour for me. Yep, thank you. Say, it'd be nice to see you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you, John. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Have a good week. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.